is a monster kid. Monster Kid is a state of mind. You can be young, you can be old, it just, it's a shared environment of being captivated by the early classic horror films. You know what it is? It's, it's somebody that grew up as a kid loving monsters, pure and simple. That feeling that there's more of us out there because, you know, monster fans are people who feel uh, as, as singular and alone as the monsters themselves. Monster Kids are people that grew up wanting the monster to win. It's such such a time for many of us when there wasn't a problem, there wasn't taxes, there wasn't politics, there wasn't fear. All we knew was Bride of Frankenstein is going to be on Saturday at 11 o'clock, and that is all I need to know. You have a passion that you, you just have to have certain things that are related to that genre. I think a monster kid is a kid when he was growing up, probably a little lonely, sometimes, at least I was. Uh, you know, it's something about monsters that they're our friends, in a way. At least they became that to me. A monster kid. Me. I'm the definition of a monster kid. I am Dracula. Even a man who is pure. The Monster Kids, we have a very special guest today. Uh, you may know the name. Um, this is John Agar III. He is the son of John Agar, who was in some of our most famous, most, most amazing films of, of the 50s and 60s. So let's welcome John Agar III. Hi, John. Hello, Michael. Thank you so much. Oh, son my of John Agar. That's amazing. Son of Kong, son of Godzilla, <laughs> son of John Agar. So let's jump right into it. You know, it's it's kind of fun for me because the name of our show is Monster Kids. And every so often I get the opportunity to talk to uh, the children of some of these legends that were in some of these great films. So you yourself, we're going to talk about being a monster kid, but you really are a monster kid, although your dad never really played the villain per se, or a monster. He was always the dashing, good looking guy, but still you're part of that. One time, hand of death, okay. hand of death. Yeah. He did play a walking baked potato <laughs> in hand of death. So yeah, it wasn't always the dashing, good looking, you know, lead man, but yeah, but yeah, I get it. Yep. And I, yeah, and but I am. Let's, let's think about this. Your dad battled the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yes, he did. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. It is actually quite a resume, really think about it. And and one of the things, Michael, before you and I started our chat today, and you and I have chatted before, but I gotta just say to anybody who would watch and, and anybody who's, you know, a fan of my father's, I am just like you, you guys. I am a fan. I am I've just been I've loved this stuff since I was a kid. I remember when I was, uh, you know, I'm 56 years old, so five years old, 1969, and I would go to the hobby shop with my mother, and I would buy the the creature, the Black Lagoon dioramas, and I would get that stuff, and Dracula, and I would stay up late and watch movies, and you imagine my surprise when I found out that my old man was, you know, hanging out with Hugh Beaumont and the mole people. You imagine how cool this stuff was but yeah, i'm just a big fan myself so and i love it i love them 
So let's talk about that. So you're a kid and you're growing up just like any other normal kid. And then when did you realize, first off, uh, you, like you say, you were a fan. When, when did you realize that you liked these films, if not loved these films? And then did you realize that not only do you like the love these films, you have a connection to them by your father? Yeah, that's a that's a multi-tiered question. I don't want to be a complete, uh, you know, take over everything here, but I have to kind of say there's this, there's a memory that kind of, I think ever since I was a kid, very young, and I remember, this is going to sound crazy, but we I grew up in Studio City, California, and my mom and dad, to entertain, I have an older brother, Martin, he's about seven years older than me, and so... Here he was about 11 or, or 12, and I'd be five or, you know, six or so, and or even younger, three, and he'd be 10. And my mom and dad would play monster with us, and just to chill us out, they would turn all the lights out in the house, and they would hide around the house and come up and go, rah, and they would let me, and I was a big Lost in face, Space fan, and I love Star Trek and everything, so that all kind of happened for me early. But I want to segue into something because I'll never forget one time sitting very young, seeing my dad watching a TV show. And I think it was some sort of episodic television, like a Western, you know, the Virginian or the Cheyenne. You know, he's been in a couple. And I look and there he is on the TV. And I'm like, wait, you know, how can you be here? And you're there. And I remember my father kind of calmly sort of just trying to keep the kid grounded maybe or just not you know he says oh son that's daddy uh, I'm on there and I'm playing a cowboy but that's make believe that's make believe and it it's probably this was probably 1969 it's probably around May or you know like March or April 69 because I distinctly remember that same television about you know, around July of 1969, sitting in that same room with my father going, look, they're landing on the moon and my mom and dad are all watching and I'm making noise. And they go, you got to be quiet. I go, why? It's just make believe. And they go, no, 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 this is real. So that, that sort of ties in with, you know, the, the, the what, what it was like in a sense. And that, that, that sort of segues, I guess, if you could say, but I, I loved monsters. I loved it. I loved, you know, scary films and all that. Ever since I was a little kid, it just grew on me. Now, did you, you, you mentioned that you got the model kits, the Aurora model kits, you know, yes. the creature diorama and Dracula and things like that. Um, what was it like growing up in that time period? So you were, you, you're 56, you said? 56. Yeah. So you were in the perfect age to be a monster kid so you had horror hosts on tv you saw the beginnings of uh, famous monsters of filmland magazine um you know there were shows on tv like lost in space and star trek and the adams family and the monsters and and that whole craze what was it like growing up in that time period you know this is i don't know it sounds like 150 years old here but what was it like i mean Look, I love where I am today. I love who I am today. But I got to say, and I don't want to sound like, you know, oh, back in those days, but it was magical. What can I say? I literally grew up in, you know, not only where, but the time I grew up in. It was magical. It was simpler. It really was. I mean, I'm sure you go back to buggy whips. It was simpler. You go back to the depression. It was simpler. You go back to the 80s for crying out loud. It was simpler. The 70s. But what was it like? Well, for one, I mean, in, in you know, Studio City is part of North Hollywood. And then, you know, a lot of your fans, everybody knows L.A. We literally played outside till the street lights went on, you know, and it was just casual and you know, what was it like? It was, uh, there was no internet or anything. So we had comic books and fan magazines and, you know, the lobby cards or something, or, you know, we had, we had model kits, we had creepy crawlers and stuff like that. We played with our imagination. We dug holes and, you know, so, I mean, what was it like? It was a different time. It was magical. It was great. I remember we would all watch a movie, I guess, uh, a little later on, maybe early 70s, but we would watch a movie. Channel 5 would run uh, like a Japanese uh, Godzilla movie or something would run it five days a week. And I just remember 
there was just a you know, small contingent of uh, you know nerds or whatever that we would just talk about it all day at school the next week. And like oh, destroy all monsters. I'll never forget that one. Two little Japanese kids. They got a submarine and they these super agents with talking radio. We just love that, man. We I just love that stuff. So you know, it was a different time, different so place. Was was your dad like? Obviously, he's been in some of the most uh, beloved horror films, uh, but his first film was actually a western, right? It was Fort Apache. Yeah, I, I mean, just a western. Yeah, yeah. Like his first film. Like, think about this. The guy goes, you know, th that's a great whole story. But you know, like he, he you know, he he meets uh, um, David O. Selznick tries to make you know make uh, woo with my grandmother. She kind of thwarts him off. Grandma takes a trip to Hawaii on a ship meets John Ford's wife, tells John Ford's wife about the woes of being seduced by Oselznik. She doesn't want any part of it, but then he promised his, her son he's going to be an actor. And then somehow or another, Ford's wife said, well, send him on over to my husband. And next thing you know, my father's at a screen test with John Ford, who's a you know, notorious Navy guy. Yeah. And think about it. This is after doing nothing. This is not like you know, he did a bunch of commercial work or this or that. There was no TV really to speak of back then. He goes to the Culver City lot. He goes over there to sell Zinco, you know, whatever Ford, wherever Ford was at, walks in. And, and uh, first thing Ford says to my father is, uh, so, you know, my father was in the U.S. Army Air Corps. And uh, he goes, so you're in the Air Corps, huh? up up on a way crash and and my father not knowing any better not realizing that this is the big shot admiral you know director par you know the man says oh i understand you're in the navy anchors away sink you know he just starts off giving some banter and they clicked and they tested my father and to cut to the beginning of the story he got screen tested for fort apache opposite John Wayne and Henry Fonda. I mean, these are two of the greatest iconic actors of all time. He had done Grapes of Fonda, done Grapes of Wrath with uh, with Ford, yeah. and Wayne, you know, forgive me, had done I think the some of the the War Wagon or some of the other stuff. But tons. He did yeah, the tons. And here he is standing on his own as the guy, the love interest with yeah. uh, first shot out of the butt. You know, can you imagine that? That's that's insane. And then also in that film was your father's first wife, Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. Wow. Who was essentially the girl next door. Right. Which is another story. But yeah. And then like she was good friends with my aunt, my aunt Joyce. Do you know what's really funny, Michael, and, and to all any fans watching now? You know, I learned more in the last 10 years just from doing some Google searches. Now, mind you somewhere packed away with my half sisters uh, in my half sister's attic because i've moved all over the country a thousand times but there's a whole box of photos original photos and, and stuff like this but i find more photos and get more history from just searching online i'll run across pictures i ran across pictures of me and my parents and just all kinds of stuff and uh there's a just just mass history out there but it, it's fascinating it's fascinating i'll i'll see stuff that you know i never even knew existed and i learned things and you're just constantly learning learning more things all the time wow so so then your dad your dad moves from from fort apache i'm assuming he must have had a pretty good relationship with john wayne because then a year later he did she wore a yellow ribbon and then, if I'm not mistaken, then a year after that, he did uh, Sands of Iwo Jima. Yeah, yeah. And just to kind of cut in between that, he did a thing with Shirley called Adventure in Baltimore, too, with Robert Young. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So, yeah, he did, uh, yeah, he did, uh, I guess, the studios or whoever the powers that be, RKO at the time said hey you know we we got a winner here we got a young up-and-comer and you know being shirley's husband i don't think hurt him at all either right. of course my father i think stood his own back then i think you know 
through the course. What was his relationship with John Wayne? Were they friends? <laughs> they were friends. They were friends. I, you know, I was thinking about this before you we called tonight, and I would say before as I was making my coffee, you know, and I was thinking to myself, times, you know, I want to share stories that are like that nobody else would get, and I'll just never forget being alone with my dad, and. You know, and, and some times of the year, John Wayne would call him and, you know, like, yeah, is John there? And who's calling? It's Duke. You know, it's the Duke. And I'm like, wow. Or it's John Wayne. He's just different all the time. But I'll just never forget without that call coming. And then my father would just say, I, I'd ask him about something, some piece of trivia or a movie. And he'd go, yeah, me and Duke did that it like and it was just such a loving and caring it was like his big brother i think he was a bit of a mentor to him and uh so yeah i mean they were friends i wouldn't say best of friends but i'd say you know it's not unknown knowledge that down the line after my father's career did his thing and the divorce from shirley and all that that later on wayne definitely acknowledged him in three of his app jack productions of chisholm Big Jake and the Undefeated. And he actually had some pretty large scenes in there. And from what I understand from my mom, he got a pretty sizable paycheck for doing it because it was some tough times. But so that was a friendly thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So then your dad does a couple other different films of, you know, Man of Conflict, Bait. He also, uh, he was the Rocket Man. Uh, he did some TV, right? He did Ford Television Theater. Lots and, of it. Yeah. But then uh, all the way till 19, I think it was 56, and here, or 55, 50, 1955. And he gets the script and gets cast for Revenge of the Creature. Can I, you're right. Can we hold that thought? I have to just jump back because you said a movie. I, here's an example of us saying, you find things on the internet with photographs and things like yeah. that I never saw. Tidbits of information that I never really knew or was totally conscious of. But the, the movie you mentioned, Rocket Man, do you know yeah. who wrote that film? Who wrote it? Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce, the comedian. Lenny Bruce, the comedian. Wow. Lenny Bruce. Yeah. And then, and I, I mean, can you believe that? Like, that's like saying, that's like saying George Carlin wrote the movie now or something right. like, you know, and I never knew that before. That's an example of, you know, and uh, I think, you know, my father had told me some stories about that because he wasn't actually the star of the film, right. but he told me some stories, but between him and I, I think he told me this. So I think, I think Lenny was probably smoking a lot of pot back then. And my dad wasn't the pot smoking guy at all. He was the John Wayne right. on the beach guy. But I remember him going, yeah, that movie was interesting. They were the writers, but you know, anyway, I digress. Let's go back to, let's go back where you were. I'm taking you back to. No, Robert I love it. And, and Lenny Bruce, but I, heard no, I don't that. know how many people know that. That's an amazing Oh, thing. I heard that. Listen, you know, it's really funny. And here's another thing. The internet. I'm on the internet one day and I find a song called John Agar Rules by the Dead Elvi. And it's great. Yeah. And in the song, they talk about the fact that John Agar did a film or Lenny Bruce was the writer. And I'm like, oh, this is, I'm going, this is crap. This can't be real. And of course, dig down, you know, dig down into the little internet hole. And sure enough, it was. So, yeah. Wow. But they do a great song called John Agar Rules, which is really cool. If anybody wants to check it out.
was he aware of the the hit that was the creature from the Black Lagoon before he took Revenge of the Creature? How did he? How did I'm he sure, come no, to no, yeah, oh, oh, definitely. Listen, de definitely. He was. Yeah, he he's conscious of the film. I mean, you know, I I could tell you he was probably more conscious of the of the rough over at the local golf course because that was his first love, but all the time. But yeah, yeah, of course he was. And, you know, here's a story I hear, and, you know, this is something that I've never been able to confirm or deny on the internet, but I've always heard rumors that um, that, that film for Universal, that, and when isn't a movie studio going through, oh, we gotta sell everything, we're going under, we're in trouble. But I've heard rumors saying that that was a little film that could, that it was a, you know, a great franchise, everybody loved the first, it was a, you know, a hit. It was a surprise hit. It was very well done, well made. It was, you know, interesting, scary. I understand that when Creature 2 Revenge came out, that it actually was one of the higher grossing films of that year, and it really helped save Universal's bacon. Yeah. Now, how true that is or not, I, but I'm pretty certain that there is, I think I've seen some tidbits of evidence that seem to support it, but, you know, what can I say? My father did those on contract, so whether it made a hundred dollars or eighty-eight dollars, he got the same flat pay for it, you know. Yeah. So this because this was the first film he did for Jack Arnold, right? And then he did Tarantula for Jack Arnold. Yes. So you know, it's always fascinating to me because as Monster Kids, we see these films, and they mean so much to us. Um, but the fact that your father was part of not one, not two, but three of the most beloved horror films from that, from that time period. I mean, you had Revenge of the Creature, then you had Tarantula, then you had The Mole People. I mean, you know, those three alone are, are absolutely some of the most beloved films from that time. Oh, that's, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Yeah, well, and I, I actually remember all three of them very, very vividly as a child when I saw them because they had an effect on me. Like, first off, Revenge of the Creature. I love the creature from the Black Lagoon. I think it's a great, great monster. Uh, it's one that, you know, it's almost to me like the, the precursor of Jaws. The thing is an animal. It lives in its environment and we're invading its turf, but it's still dangerous, right? But, Absolutely. But we put ourselves in harm's way. And then with Tarantula, <laughs> you know, uh, I love, I, I was arachnophobic when I was younger. Who so, is it? Right. Well, so seeing that spider and then as it got bigger in that, that tank behind Leo G. Carroll. Well, isn't that great? I mean, oh, like today, fun. you know what I hear people sometimes say is like, I don't watch anything back in those. There's people, younger people. I don't watch anything from back then. And I go, but you got to, you got to see the way they did this. Just the fact that they did it. They didn't have green screen. They didn't, you know, it was, right. it was great. It was classic. I, I loved it. And the sounds, I, I agree. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That touched me the same way. Imagine that. Like, I mean, the only difference is I was watching my father in it. So I guess I might've been polluted in a way and not always in a good way, but in a cool way too. Hey, my dad's winning. Oh, oh. But yeah. I was polluted somehow, but I, maybe I wasn't, but I loved it too. I was just as awestruck by it. I will say that, you know, I will say that I'm still, you know, film when it's done good, it doesn't matter if you know it's a film. Uh, my father taught me really early on that if you watch a movie, and I remember watching a film with him once, and God, I can't remember what it was, but I said, oh man, I hate that guy. That guy's terrible, I hate him. And I was referring to the character, and he goes, oh, that's, and yeah, I don't, that was Joe or whatever. Oh, Joe's the sweetest, nicest man. I go, oh, he just seems like the biggest jerk. And not three weeks later, I meet Joe, you know, or I, whatever, I meet the actor, and he is the nicest guy on earth. And, and it really opened my eyes to like, you know, kind of opened the fourth, what do they call it? the fourth door, the, the fourth window. It just kind of gave me insight on it. So, yeah. so yeah. let's talk about your childhood a little bit. Let's go there. Sure. Like, so 
what was the first time you what was the movie that you think really really bit you like what was the bug that bit you and you like i love these movies what what was it oh my god that's a that's a good question that's a you know it's a really good question you gotta rem well <laughs> this is for I think it was before, I think it was probably Dracula or Frankenstein. Right. Probably Frankenstein. Yeah, that's a popular probably one. late night, probably KTLA Channel 5, Channel 13. Back in when I was growing up, there was only five channels or whatever. Right. Probably yeah. later at night. I was probably sneaking up it was Saturday or Sunday. But I think those hit me. I think I think the the classic universal horror hit me. But I, but it's funny you say that because I do have sort of a funny story because I guess it would put me at around seven years old and I remember going to a drive-in with my mom and she didn't know what kind of movie it was and she took my brother and I to go see THX 1138 which was George Lucas's student film yeah dystopian film with you know God I I understand it now but I can't even imagine when I was thinking at seven. Right. And I just remember my mom trying to cover our eyes due to the nudity in it, but but I just knew then that was for me. I just knew, man, this I love this stuff. Like I love it. Not to mention, look, I love Marty. I love you know. I love the classic stuff. You know, I love Shane. I love all yeah. the. But I but I have a special soft spot for sci-fi and horror and fantasy, definitely. So when you when you would watch these movies on your channel 13, you said? And 13, channel 11, channel 9, channel 5, yeah, the local, the local affiliate. A lot of people don't realize today that, uh, first off, there were not many channels, right? There, there wasn't cable, there wasn't the, the accessibility that there is today. And no. in fact, I sometimes feel that my generation is the, is the, reason we have the accessibility because we wanted it so much we wanted to possess this anytime we wanted it right so you have the inventions of like vhs and being able to collect films and that became a big thing but so i i i was the same as you i i discovered those films through you know a late night horror host um and I, you know at what point did you really connect that or see for the first time that your dad was part of this horror heritage? I guess I knew fairly early that he was in the horror films. I yeah. guess that I kind of figured out fairly early because then the funny part of that is, is this is kind of funny, is that some of the less than quality movies, like some of the Buchanan stuff, and that would run in the early 70s, you know? So there would be more stuff. But as I started to get a little older and I started to see, like I would go to a, a you know, he used to be involved with the Science Fiction Fantasy Academy, you know, and, and we would go there and I would go to the table shows and I would see for the first time masses amounts of my father's collectibles before the internet, mind you. And I would, you know, and of course there was some, you know, I remember growing up, we had some pretty good posters for Golden Mistress, Star in the Dust. We had original stuff from Sansi Wijima. We had some stuff around the house, but not enough to like, to, you know, as like a forensic scientist to like put it all together. Like, but I'm, I remember going somewhere and seeing the, the triad, as you call it, the universal triad. Yeah. You know, uh, revenge, tarantula, mole oh, people, yeah. just seeing that. And the, and the definite higher quality and better look of that than some of the other productions that you see. Or even the, the modern way it looked as opposed to some of the older classic horrors. But God forbid, I'm not knocking those at all. But right. And I think it just, I think it was pretty young, pretty young age, seven, eight years old. I think I started to get that, wow. And then, and then of course, my whole life, my father would answer all his fan mail and he would get oodles of it, tons of it, as long as we, as long as he lived. And my father was adamant about if you sent him a 
self-addressed stuffed envelope. And I'm talking, some people would send, you know, poster tubes. He would sign every each and last one of them and send them out. Sometimes on his, a lot of time on his own dime. My mother used to get stacks of photos. I remember they used to go down, there was a photo shop off Hollywood Boulevard and we lived in the Valley and she'd drive over Cold Water Canyon. And I go, what did you do, Ma? Where were, you, where were you? She goes, oh, I was just picking up your dad's pictures. And then she'd sit my dad down and, you know, in the living room and he would just sign them up and then he'd personalize them, but he'd have them kind of pre-done, sign his name, John Agar, God bless. But then he'd personalize them for people when they called, but and he did that out of a labor of love. He didn't, it wasn't some self-promotion. He did it because somebody was in, somebody wanted or cared enough to ask him for that. And, and I know I've said this, you know, and I've said this in interviews, but I, I know it's been written about my father, but man, this was so true. His whole philosophy wasn't, you know, he got kind of lampooned in a way. I mean, he was in some of the John Ford stuff in the beginning. And then in the fifties and stuff, the ones we love weren't looked at with the highest esteem. And that's all here nor there. He got the last laugh there, didn't he? Because, you yes, know, they're, they're some of the most loved, right? But uh, so career wise, you know, some of the Hollywood people would look at him as less than royalty or whatever, whatever, uh, they look down on him or whatever. But my father never, lived in that bubble my father's whole outlook was if he gave you any enjoyment whatsoever then he did his job end of story he once told me um if you can get anything out of being my son go ahead and get it and i thought yeah but it's like at the same token the fact that anyone's interested in my dad it's like he's my dad i love my dad you know I don't own a domain. I don't sell stuff from him or anything, but this is great. You think about this. I'm talking about my dad. Now, if my dad was a plumber, I may not be talking about the toilets he plunged in his lifetime, but, but I would just be just as proud. It's like my father didn't plumb. He didn't fix houses. He didn't, you know, he wasn't an accountant, you know, whatever. My father pretended that he was a professor saving us from monsters. He thought, you know, he pretended he was a gunslinger shooting it out with, you know, Black Bart. I mean, that's what he did. And that's, and that, no, that's way cool. I mean, that's way cool. Oh, by the way, it's, it's World Series night. I'm taking, I'm thinking the Dodgers might have won. Oh. Because there's there's fireworks. So if there's noise, it's because LA is about to explode. So anyway. no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Tampa. No, it's perfect. Tampa Bay lost. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not a big. My father was a huge sports fan. He loved all sports. Yeah. Well, along with golfing. I mean, you told me a story. Like, well, you even said it earlier in here. Your your dad was just as much at home on a golf course more at home and i think too back in the day and probably even today what do i know i'm not out on the but the deals get done at the golf course but had my father not become an actor he would have maybe became a semi-pro golfer he would have tried to become a professional golfer he was he had that much love for it and in between acting gigs, you know actors are just props that eat and they don't work all the time and I made that joke up anyway. My father used to tell me that, but they don't work. You know, the thing about the thing about some people's dads when they're plumbers, they're home like every week and they're home at five o'clock and they yell at you for playing in the yard or whatever. My father was there three months out of the year and then he'd be gone for a month and then he'd be back and then he'd be gone. So that was a whole different sort of thing. But uh, he loved golfing that was his like when he wasn't acting well he made a good little chunk on his little month acting gig so he's got a few months off and he would golf and that was his thing that was his love and he played with some you know, i guess there was a team like the hollywood hackers he would go to i remember some of the best trips i took in my lifetime we used to go to pat boone's golf course up in a golf uh tournament up in washington and I mean, I was babysat by Debbie Boone and just all sorts of great stuff. We would be up there with Bill Bixby from 
the Incredible Hulk and Courtship, Betty's father. I would hang out and meet really, we were really close friends with Dick Long, who had a show called Nanny and the Professor. But some of the great things we got to do because of celebrity were those kind of things. And it, and it was all centered on golf. The All the celebrities said, yeah, who are we going to get? Let's get Agar. They would grab dad and dad would be, you'd get three local guys from Hoquiam, Washington, and you'd get John Agar and you'd throw Pat Boone in there and these guys would be happier than hell and hell, they'd win the match. So that's great. Yeah, that's cool. So as as you start to grow up a little bit, like tell me, tell me how you're fascinated. I look like I've grown up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't grown up much. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's consistent. I appreciate that. I appreciate the attempt at a at a compliment, but nah, I haven't quite grown up yet. But that's okay. <laughs> so as, as as you continue to be a monster kid, what what was what was your fascination like? What was you you said Frankenstein was probably the first one, but did you did you read famous monsters? Did you you know did you mail away to get the 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 masks and and things like that well how how deep was your fascination you know i have to i have to preface that stuff by saying i am and to this day i still suffer from some procrastination so when you said that i wish that i could show you a a huge room here let me take you over here michael let's bring the audience and take them over to a room where um you know i've saved stuff yes i have had stuff collected over the years i've had books and famous monster magazines and i've had things that uh um you know uh things from you know from comic book conventions and Yes, I've ordered stuff out. I think I ordered the x-ray glasses, but that just tells you where I was at, right? But yeah, I mean, I did all that, but no, nah, I didn't, I just didn't, I'm not a, I just didn't keep it. And I think that, that that's, I, I wish I could say I didn't, but, you know, I'll even tell you that, you know, I lost, I had my father's Fantasy Film Academy. He won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Film Academy. And I... I lost it. I lost it during a move and, and at a very critical point in my life. So, you know, I'm sad about that. I had a golden boot award too from the, that I had. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, be, well, listen, I don't, I don't want to lie to anybody. It was during a really low point in my life. And I had a, I had a storage facility out by the beach when I lived in Ventura and I didn't pay my bill. And you know what happens when you don't pay your bill on your, on your storage yeah. you go back three months later going i got your money and they go who the hell are you he sold anyway yeah so i've had things like that happen it's sad but i don't regret it all the thing is you can never take the one bit of trivia and the one souvenir that i'll always have and that he was my father yeah How well cool that's that? that's a great that's a great souvenir your name very much <laughs> right um, yeah you know imagine i was going to say you, you mentioned my name you know what's really weird do, do you know that my, i have a brother that was born in 1958 and that i was named john agar the third he wasn't usually it's the firstborn son that's given the name john the third yeah and yeah i never really understood why but i do know that during that time charles black and shirley temple were looking to adopt Linda Sue Temple, Linda Sue Agar, my my dad's daughter. Yeah. And that, uh, that that basically in those days there was more connection between exes and all that, and that there was some legal wranglings going on between me and them. I know I was alluding to that. It didn't have anything to do with my name, but I was always fascinated that I got the name, but. I tell people, and it's whether it's true or not, but I was traded for Shirley Temple's daughter, who is in fact my half sister. So <laughs> go figure. Yeah. That's that's uh, you know to me, you know the monster kids and the monster tie-in. That's that's I love that. That warms my heart. Yeah. But didn't think that my half sister is Shirley Temple's daughter. That like 
wow that blew my mind that blows my mind in. that's awesome that's really awesome what what did your dad feel about the horror films i mean he was very appreciative of any attention and anything that his work uh you know how it made people feel but did he have a special place in his heart for the horror films did he like did he like being in horror films did he like those films i think my father had as much love for every film that he did based on the experience that he had with the people that made them and the people that wrote them and for the art that they represented. Do I think he liked them? Yeah, I think in his heart he did. Am I going to sit here and tell you, oh, you just love them? I'm not going to say that. But I'm going to tell you that in reality, he just had... And he wasn't an artsy guy. He was just a golfing guy, man. He was just a guy that just happened to want to be a golfer and became an actor. But I was just going to say that, no, I think, you know, he would chuckle. And he, I think the, the, the better ones, yeah, he went, we sat, we watched Revenge together. I've sat and watched it with him. And he talked about Rico Browning and what an amazing diver he was and how he held his breath. And he would talk about being free run at, Marineland and just how exciting it was and how dangerous some of the fish in the tanks were and he was using the scuba equipment I mean but he just had stories of the experiences and then the he'd say things like oh the director told me to do this and then I missed it and did it and you should have seen me son I plopped in butt first and splashed and I didn't look too cool then I mean my father was you know so but he loved them all but do I think he had a, I, you know, that's funny. I think he embraced him as time went on. I think that, I don't think that he had any animosity towards him. As he said before, and I think he meant it. I think I, I'm just going to allude back to this, Michael, because it really does, I think, you know, I just had an epiphanous moment when you said that. He said it before, you know, some of the stuff I did wasn't considered Citizen Kane. But if it gave anybody any enjoyment, right. I'm grateful for it. And I think he likes some of them because he great. had a lot of great stories about him. You, you know, I don't know if you've ever, if I told you, and maybe I did, but um, one of the most interesting stories having to do with the, the triad, I'm going to call them now, the yeah. triad, the agar triad, the yeah. universal was, and I heard this, this is one of those things you hear after the fact and now i knew that my father knew a lot of different actors and he'd chat about them and you hear about them it was always kind of interesting like i'd hear my mom and dad talking about somebody i'd go you know just throwing this out there but dustin hoffman it's like oh yeah, yeah he was you know whatever he wasn't one but rock hudson you'd hear the name and just a few other like bigger name stars and but they're talking about him because yeah they had a pipe burst at their house that's how they're talking to him or there was a there was a, they got their car got scratched at a valet or whatever it was anyway but uh my dad was doing uh mole people at universal and he was on contract and that was you know the third hand of the you know that's part of his five-year contract it was one of the films he had to do John Carradine was in it. We got Hugh Beaumont and uh, they're making it. And you've seen the movie and it was a uh, doozy. They even used some of the techniques from that for their tour for the quicksand and all that. Mm -hmm. They had implemented it. So they're on this set. They've got these guys running around in shiny mole suits and it's light and dark and blah, blah, blah. And it's crazy looking. It's insane. And my dad t tells me one day that Rock Hudson comes in, he's shooting who the hell knows what next door, pillow talk, or he's got Doris Day at a convertible next door, right? It's some fancy middle-class America set. And my dad's out here in this sparkly, you know, psycho bit, that, right? And he comes in and he goes, hey, you know, how's it going, Agar? Oh, hey, Rock. And he goes, he looks over at my father and goes, Agar, what in the hell did you get yourself into? And I just thought that was, damn, that's just amazing. That's an amazing thing. You wouldn't think about that like that. You just right. don't think that, you know, 
you got to kind of have that dynamic. They're on a lot. There's Lucille Ball had a bungalow over there and, you know, a lot of different stars and they're shooting their movie. And, you know, you see this when you're watching a movie made of movies, you know, like the old Mel Brook movie when they show yeah. the, they show the cafeteria and you've got Spaceman and, and that's the way it was. And you got Rock Hudson walking in on John Agar going, what in the hell have you gotten yourself into? I thought that was really funny, man. That's awesome. That's a that great is, story. That is a good one. So one of the stories you shared with me, and I'd love you to share with our, our listeners and our viewers, is um, uh, a young man, his first film was Revenge of the Creature, a young man that went on to greatness uh, cinematically by the name of Clint Eastwood. And um, you told me a story that uh, about Clint Eastwood that I'd love you to share here and your dad. You got it. Um, yeah. Um, so Clint Eastwood was an understudy with my father when they were both on contract at Universal. I guess my father had a little more uh, under his belt with uh, Sands and all that other good stuff. So, and Clint was a little younger. And so, yeah, um, they, they put Clint in with the, uh, you know, in some of my father's films and, you know, and then they, you know, time went on and I don't think they stay close. I do remember this. Here's a little tidbit. My mom had the Epic phone book. It had everybody in it. Gregory Peck, Bob Hope. And I'm talking, I used Bob's dead now. I can say it, but I used to call that number and it was his number. He literally was the only one that answered it. But at any rate, and he had. Uh, Wait, so you prank called Bob Hope? Yeah, more. I wouldn't say I did anything maliciously. I just picked it up to make sure it worked. But um, uh, what was it? Where was I going? Who, who were you uh, talking Clint Eastwood. about? Oh yeah, thank you. I remember. I never because he he's like serious dude. I've seen all the fistful of dollars movies and Dirty Harry. I wouldn't do that. But they would always have Maggie and Clint Eastwood's number in the phone book. But they weren't close. Like, there wasn't a closeness there. But uh, as I guess it was 1989, maybe. Uh, you could probably correct me on this, or the fans will. Uh, when he was given the Academy Award for The Unforgiven. 1993. 19, well, there you go. 1993. Yeah. That my father got a phone call in, in his house. We lived in Burbank. And he got a phone call from Clint Eastwood immediately after receiving the Academy Award on the stage, called my dad and said, John, I want to thank you for everything you did for me when I was at Unifor, or whatever he said, or for being, I don't know exactly what was said, but I know that it touched my father and it really made him feel good. It made him feel accepted, you know? One of the things, I don't know if I talked to you about this much, but, you know, my father had some bouts with alcoholism, you know, growing in the business. He was an alcoholic and he was a recovered alcoholic. I want to throw that in there. He was clean and sober with me my entire life. And, you know, so, but back in the early days before alcoholism was known as a disease, it was maybe just a moral weakness right. and Hollywood wasn't as open-minded yeah, it caused a little bit of chaos for him. And, uh, you know, and I think, and I think that had affected maybe some people putting him into films at the time, you know, their surety bonds, or maybe they're afraid if you drank and, you know, even after you get sober, they're afraid that you may screw up or something. And I think that might have affected him. I'm not saying for sure. You know, I've always felt like it was a double standard then. It was just the way that was then. Because, look, I love Robert Dowdy Jr. I think he's amazing. I've actually met him before um, on a personal level. But <laughs> we won't talk about that. But here this guy shot heroin and laid in some kid's bed in Malibu. And he's the highest paid actor in the whole country. It's like, you know, they let that go where my father had a couple bouts with alcoholism. They took a picture of him on a tractor and it kind of ended up blackballing him. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. But, you know, I mean, there's, there is some truth to that. I mean, there is some, and also the Shoei Temple thing. But people are, people are a lot more cool now. People are a lot more open. And uh, 
we forget about all that now. All we remember is just what lives on the celluloid. Right. And what lives on the celluloid is my old man is a hero. He's a hero. Yeah. He saves the day. Yeah. That's how cool is that? And here's another funny part. He was just my dad. He was just like you or me. He's going down to Vaughn's and getting his quart of milk. And you know what I'm saying? It's kind of a funny thing, too. I remember, you know, he, one minute you're watching, he's like, you know, getting King Kong off of the Empire State Building or whatever. He's, you know, and the next minute he's just out picking up charcoal briquettes at the supermarket for some barbecue. You know, <laughs> just a normal guy. It's just, you know. We what does John him. Agar do after he's defeated the mole people? <laughs> he grills. He grills. Charcoal <laughs> briquettes. Yeah, you get it. Oh, it's wonderful. So as, as you got older and, and your relationship, obviously you became a teenager and then you, you were in your 20s and 30s. What, what, was, uh, what was your father's perspective like? Like, did you ever want to follow him into the business? Did you have any aspirations of becoming, you know, I'm going to be like my old man? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, like I say, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit lazy and a procrastinator. And yeah, you know, I, but, but I, but I think my father figured out quite early, you know, I'd probably do it now, but I have no talent. But the thing is, I have a emotional maturity for it now that I didn't have as a young man. But I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah, I kind of wanted to do it. Yeah, sure. I, it was real obvious to me that I wasn't as good looking as my old man. I knew that right off the bat. So I knew I wasn't going to get that angle. And, you know, I wasn't quite fat enough to be pugsley or whatever. And so on that note, here's a funny story. My dad did get me a tryout for a very famous movie at the time. I was a little league. My dad coached our little league team. And one of the little league uh, managers uh, was one of the uh, um agents that handled the, the the casting for a film called the bad news bears with walter Matthau, and i actually was on set yet at paramount for three calls on that film and i was actually going to be going out as the uh as the catcher because i was a heavy set chunky kid i'm still a big fat adult but you know um and i went there one time i went one day i went one time in one part of the studio in an office and when another time we went outside, we were tossing baseballs and talking to some producers. The third time I went there, I was on set with, I think it was Tatum O'Neill and the other kid that was you know, there and several other actors. And we were actually inside the old Brady Bunch set, which was still there. I mean, this is like 74, 75, right. whatever, but it was still there, but it wasn't struck down yet, but it was the interior backyard. And I go, wow, I remember looking going, Holy shit! This is this is this is the Brady Yard, and so then we did this. We did some stuff, some talking. <laughs> if I had been myself, because I had the foulest mouth of any kid you've ever met, but I was like, yes, sir. And those, had I known he had to do a little cussing and stuff, I might have got it. But ultimately, I was going for the catcher, and they didn't call me back, and it crushed me. I think I probably we lived again in in the Burbank at the time driving back over the hill. I think I cried nonstop. I just don't think I could handle the, the rejection. Mm -hmm. My parents saw that early and just thought he doesn't have the, he doesn't want this thing bad enough and we're not going to be stage parents and so on. But that was like, that was one of my big, one big things. I mean, literally bad news bears. I, I have no idea how close I was. I could have been the 10th fat kid they kicked out that morning or the, hundredth they didn't I don't know I have a feeling I was up fairly close because of who was there right but ultimately I wasn't talented or fat enough or funny enough <laughs> so that's it so yeah that note you know so then so then what did you choose like tell us a little bit about your 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 uh your career yeah I chose I chose the path of least resistance I chose a kind of a wild and just crazy mixed up life uh, for a while. Um, you know, back in the, you know, I was 20, I was 21 years old, 1985. And, uh, you know, I kind of dabbled in different stuff. And as time went on, I, I sort of found my niche in, uh, um, 
technology. I kind of, you know, I kind of found my my calling in in sales and business development inside sales. And I sort of morphed and I got involved in a, in a hard drive manufacturing company at the time, which made AV rated drives, which led me into other areas of, of connections and, you know, kind of touched on some creative things, but, um, you know, on and off, uh, as time went on too, I mean, I, I worked for a slow motion control company, which did a lot of stuff for like, the sports teams across the country, like the, you know, the Bengals, just all a lot of different sports stadiums. And, uh, uh, but with, the, with, with, uh, my crop was corporations, what they were called, they were eventually bought out by Mac store, but they owned a raid array systems. Anybody in digital video knows what that is. And I worked on some of the original stuff for targeting systems for the Trident submarines. I worked on for nuclear weapons, uh, cool stuff. I worked on some uh, deals with some stuff for Graham Nash and Todd Rundgren. Nash was doing some lithography stuff and he was using digital storage for storage. Walter Becker of Steely Dan, I was doing some sound stuff for him. Uh, equipment, mind you, I wasn't doing the artwork. True Lies and AFI, they had come up, AFI had come up with some software called uh, No Strings Attached or actually it was the other way around. AFI came up with a software that was getting the lines out of old film. They were digitizing film. And you know, when you have an old piece of film it has scratches and stuff on yeah. it, they came out with a with an algorithm, C plus blank plus T equals cat. And in an algebraic equation, they were able to match that missing piece and digitize it where before they would have to hand paint every cell they were able to do it. And when they did this, they figured out as a side note of this software, it was able to erase ropes and lines when you're hanging things in movies. And so me and another guy, their team took technology over them to morph this over for the movie True Lies. Mm -hmm. And then it also laid itself out for Forrest Gump, The Feather. I think my Cropless Corporation is even titled. They're even credited in the movie Forrest Gump. And then I know that uh, I worked for another company after that called Mega Drive Systems, where we sold massive amounts of storage to uh, a company nobody had ever heard of at the time. And God forgive me, I can't even remember the name now. <laughs> Who's, who are the people that made Toy Story? What was the name Pixar. of that company? Pixar. Huh? Pixar. Thank you. Nobody had heard of them at all, not realizing but we ended up selling a whole bunch of storage for the original silicon graphic machines that did the original Toy Story. So I did some of the first stuff where they started testing the renderings and all that. And I got to meet some of the cool people, but I didn't do the art. I'm not, you know, the creative guy, but I was just the rock star with the goodies. So, <laughs> and that's it. And then, you know, I've been in sales and market development. I, Worked for the Los Angeles Times for several years, and I worked for a startup uh, luxury website. And and then you know, every now and then I'll get a buyout or I'll get hit by a bus, and I just take a year or two off here. I'm, I'm just kidding, no buses, <laughs> no buses. Okay. <laughs> but you know, I get a lot, you know, a chunk of change. I'm a bit of a gypsy, but I, I've been with my last company now for about five years, which is a digital ad agency. And you know, so far so good. Knock wood, I'm working in this current situation we're in. So that's a blessing. Yeah, absolutely. A real blessing. A real blessing. Yeah. So, so during the during the late 70s, I'm going to say, is when uh, a lot of the conventions started popping up, like uh, Famous Monsters and Fangoria, that would have uh, gatherings of, of fans of these films. <laughs> it, when did when did you become aware of those? When did your dad become aware of those? Did you ever go to the conventions with your dad? Big time, yeah, big time. I went to a lot of the local LA stuff. He had gone to a few out in Knoxville and traveled to some. I didn't get to go out to any of those with him, but early earlier on i got to go to a couple of them and then i also know that there were some in some local places like uh um god i think I, for some reason or another i keep remembering a star trek i went to one of the first star trek conventions out yeah. here in probably the 70s yeah and uh, because 
his whole, that whole little inner circle world hooked it up. But I had tapped on it. I didn't, I didn't immerse in it because quite frankly, I was interested in girls, fast cars and smoking a lot of pot back then. Maybe, you know, I'm just saying, but I definitely tapped or I danced around the periphery of it. And I definitely started to, as you know, as I got older and everything, I would become more and more in awe of the amount of material. And even to this day, you know, not a year goes by that I almost don't discover a TV episode or a show or something that my father did. Here's something for you. You know, my dad was in the show Family Affair with um, Brian Key, uh, Buffy and Jody, and he yeah. played their uncle Gabe. But how I knew this, I remember seeing that when it was actually on. Now, that's another one. I love that show growing up. And imagine me seeing, hey, what are you doing with them kids? Why can't they come over and play? That's one of those things. But like, but that's an example of not only do I find it or I hear about them, I'm actually able to grab copies of these things now and see the work that he did. Yeah. You mentioned one earlier about like my father did, I think, with, with uh, um you, you mentioned two movies. One of them's on the internet. It's Ed, Ed Arnold, Edward Arnold, and my father, Man of uh, Conflict. Uh, you're right, right, right. Um, Man of Conflict. Man I of couldn't conflict. believe that. That's an RKO movie, and I'm telling you, it's not the, it's not Citizen Kane by any stretch, but it's definitely different than what you would see my father in. And my father holds his own in that. I was right. pretty impressed. Oh, that's but great. There's, but there's a whole ton of stuff that you'll find that you wouldn't find before. So when I would go through the paper shows and stuff, I would find movies and more movies I'd never even heard of. Like I remember James Franciscus did a movie with dinosaurs and I thought that was great. I knew his daughter growing up, Connie Franciscus. But uh, at any rate, I would just be exposed to this stuff and it would just open up my eyes to it before. But I got to say, today with the internet, like you said, with all the TV channels, what a golden age of film and trivia everybody lives in now. What a, count your blessings. You're in the land of milk and honey these days. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm just like you. I remember when that's why we bought magazines is because I wanted to keep that photo and I wanted to keep that article. And now even though I still collect because it's almost a nostalgia thing for me. Sure. I know that instead of going to grab a book, I can just type it into Google search and get more information than any book. You know, it's, it's, the book, it's yeah, the book is great to have, but yeah. like, not only that, you wanted the book because yeah, listen, I remember, I remember recording things off of the radio on cassette tapes yeah. because I thought this is a great song. I don't know if I can find the album or whatever. Right. Yeah right now literally i've got you know two services that i run from home through my cell phone and you can hear anything but it's Any song you want. it's amazing so, as your dad got older it's interesting he ended up working with two horror legends he worked with clive <laughs> barker and nightbreed yeah and then he worked with john carpenter in body bags were you aware of that like what were is, is there any fun uh, oh yeah anecdotes so about that oh yeah that's see that's good stuff because now you're getting into my later in life and uh believe me i have a huge appreciation for john carpenter so what should we start off with what was this what was the chronology of those was it uh, i think first not nightbreed was first with Clyde i think it was Burke. nightbreed was first i wasn't on that set but nightbreed i know that one of the things that, that I've always kind of blown away about is that is in the movie was Craig Sheffer's movie and Sheffer went on to do a river runs through it with Brad Pitt, which is to me amazing. That's like, that's like going from, that's like going from creature of the black lagoon to Fort Apache. He did it the other way around. Right. right. You know, my dad did Fort Apache, then creature. He did creature then Fort Apache for the most part, but yeah, that was amazing because who doesn't know Clyde Barker? And that was an amazing film. And I was, uh, I loved it. And, you know, me and my friends got a big hoot out of it because he ties them up with Christmas lights. And th there was an element of my dad's just very mellow, 
he wasn't that timid, but that was just my old man. He was just chill. He just, he could act him. And my dad, my dad was the kind of guy who could command himself in a room without being commanding. I don't know how to explain that. He just knew that you didn't mess with my dad, but he never came off as somebody you didn't mess with. He also came off as somebody who would be very timid that, oh, watch out, you could blow him over the feather. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's a good trait, you know? Hey, don't F with him, but hey, look at the little old guy. Don't knock him over. It's <laughs> both of those elements in him. Let's fast forward to body bags. Yeah. So I'm working at the time for a marketing services firm in San Fernando, California, and they are using an old hospital building in Pacoima. And I get a call from my mom and my mom goes, what are you doing today, honey? And I go, you know, I'm working, ma, yeah, good for you, right? And she goes, you know, your dad's shooting right down the street from your work. He called me to ask if you wanted to come down and check it out because I had never gotten to do a lot of seeing stuff. So I go and I go down there and there's the huge, there it is, Fort, Fort Hollywood, you know, the trailers, the whole shooting match, the, the whole crew, kit and caboodle, carpenters and dressing room. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is big doings. So I go in, I find my dad, he's got a nice size little trailer in there for a dressing room. And then he takes me into the hospital. And, and like, I remember some people with headphones, obviously production assistants are like, who are you? What are you doing here? And like, my father would just walk up and go, oh, hey, darling, this is my son, John. And like, all of a sudden it's like, do you want a pack of gum? It was like, it just changed. It was so cool. Everybody had such sort of love for my old man. Now in that scene, he films with, was Roger Corman. I could have swore there was another famous director in that scene. And they had requested from John that they be in that, that they be in that scene with him. That like, they were like, you know, like, hey, we, we love to work with John because my father plays the main doctor that does the eyeball right. for Mark Hamill. So I got to kind of check it out. And I got to watch their process. And it was just really, you know, I studied film and television, but it was just really wild watching um, them do things. And I'll just never forget them, you know, quieting off the scene. It was a full on emptied hospital. And it was all of you or something. I'm not sure, but it was an empty, it was just fun. And I remember watching Mark Hamill do his scenes by himself. I got the quick chance to just say hi real quick, but it was clear that he was in his character doing his business. So there wasn't a lot of, hello, how do you do? It was just like, oh, hey, nice to meet you. He's back over to his job. It's like, I wouldn't want you coming to my work and bothering me. And I understood that. So fast forward later, though, after that whole shoot and uh, everything, John Carpenter invited the family, my mother and father, and they took me and my uh, ex-wife at the time, wife at the time with us. And we went up to his house off of Woodrow Wilson Drive to a Christmas party. And he had the most incredible layout. It was, I'm sure he had some of his artwork, his craft service people, his uh, local, his prop makers. He had a gingerbread house that just took up the whole back of a wall with a buffet in front of it. It was like lit up with a little train set. And his whole swimming pool was covered with candle lit poinsettias. And I sat down in the yard and then my father and mother were out there and Mark Hamill walks up and my dad says, Hey, Mark, how's it going? And Mark goes, John, how are you doing? Hey, what's up, buddy, buddy. And I'm like, I'm just sitting there like, I, 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 it's Mark Hamill. And you know, it's Mark. He's a, and Mark sits down and my dad points over to me and my wife. We're sitting there. We're drinking free booze. John, carpenter's booze at his table in front of his pool and goes hey mark this is me you, you met you were working last time but this is my son john you met him briefly on the set and he goes hey john how are you and i go hey i want you to meet my wife laura and he sat down at that table i should say shit you know he sat down we talked about the weather we talked about christmas we just talked about everything in the in the world and ate hors d'oeuvres for about a half an hour. And just one of the nicest, sweetest guys I've ever met in my life. And to this day, I still 
cherish that moment. And, you know, I'm so glad that he's back as Luke Skywalker. So but that was, for. those are the things I get. And I guess that's the things that you got as being the son of John Agar that most other people wouldn't like maybe experience it that way. You could probably work on the set, work in the industry, but to have that, to have that reverence, to see that reverence from like Roger Corman and my father, they were all very gracious and hey, John, they were all very happy to be with him. And to see that graciousness from a star like, you know, Mark Hamill, I mean, he in himself is a cultural icon in America, in the world. And to have him like, oh, John, hi, and just have a reverence. I remember he even talked to me about some of my father's old films and contracts and stuff in the day. And that, that, that touches, that like touches my heart and to see it and to live it today. Like my father's been gone, I guess about 18 years now. And, you know, you never forget your mother, your father, but to see the way he lives in some other people and in you and fans and that people care. And I mean, you know, that touches my heart, but all he, all he did it for was for your sheer enjoyment. That was it. That's all he wanted. It's so pure and beautiful when you really think about it. That's all he wanted. That's what he wanted. If you're getting that, that's what he wanted for you. He didn't want your stamps or your dollar bills. He might have taken some dollar bills, but, you know, golf balls. <laughs> but anyway, but that was some fun stuff, man. That so, was And he won, uh, he won an award that, that recognized him as as an icon in the genre of sci-fi and horror he sure did he won he was one of the first recipients of the lifetime achievement award from the science fiction and fantasy academy and it's online you can actually see the the list of people they've given it to and so yeah yeah he was given some recognition he was so young. did he did he was he aware of how how much he was loved uh, before he passed? Like, did it finally dawn on him that all of that work and the reverence that we have as fans for him and that he was, you know, for us uh, as little kids, he was the embodiment of a hero. He was our hero. And Michael, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. Michael, if you had met me first, 20 years ago, we would go to my father's house and we would sit in his house. You would sit on the couch and you would chat with him. And he would, there was no way that he could not have known because literally you would go into his den, my mother and father's den in the house and the table was covered. And literally part of my father's last working days of his life were to just answer fan mail. And it came all the time, thick piles. The guy was 79 to 80 years old when he passed. He had thick piles like this coming almost 40 years later. So, yeah, do I think that he knew? Yeah, I mean, I think he knew, but I think that, you know, yeah. I mean, do I think it went to his head? No. I mean, do, do, do you know what I mean? No, no, yeah. not that way. Yeah, no, of course. But did he know? how important it was. Yeah, and, I, and I'll tell you, people might think this is funny or not, but I think some of the stuff that are loved by others, like, hey, yo, I know one of the gentlemen, Ed, wanted to talk to me about Larry Buchanan films. They're great. Some of them are insane. I know some of the less than, maybe more embarrassing films are here, but ones that maybe he just sort of buzzed on through to get the check. Maybe he did a few like that, or you know, you get on a set and you go, oh, my God, these guys are just incompetent. But we'll just see what comes out because you never know what's going to come out. I mean, listen, I'm sure it looks I could tell you it probably looks very much the same on a John Carpenter set as it does on an Ed Wood set. But you're going to get two very clearly different products at the end. Okay. Right. Yeah, so yeah. but I still know that he never even he'd roll his eyes a little like, oh, what was I thinking? but he didn't have any like regret or disdain. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Kind of a funny. And speaking yeah. of Ed Wood, you told me that Ed Wood actually pursued your father 
several times, correct? Yeah, there's a there's a double tie in there. You know, my father obviously worked with, you know, he was an Alcoholics Anonymous. So part of Alcoholics Anonymous 12 steps is once you've sort of got your own spiritual enlightening and you've learned how to not drink, you know, you learn how to whatever, you pass that on to other people. Part of your 12 steps, part of your program is to help others to not drink. So I know that he had been in contact with him on that basis. But Ed Wood had always tried to reach out to my father for some of his legitimate films and some of his less than legitimate films, which he had a thing. And he would always come after my dad. But I'll never forget, I probably had to be, had to be sometime after 71, 72, probably before he passed. So I don't know what year he passed. And it was, you know, I think it was 73 or four. But so this is just before he passed. But I remember picking up the phone at the house and somebody says, hello, uh, could I speak to John, please? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, who's calling? He goes, well, tell him that it's Ed Wood, the producer. And I'm like, oh, shit, a producer. I put the phone over, you know, hey, mom, mom. She goes, who is it? I go, some producer guy, maybe some work for pop or something. She goes, who is it? He goes, it's Ed Wood, the producer. And they're. Like she just goes and rolls her eyes and goes, oh, and gets on it nicely. Oh, hi, Ed. Oh, this is Loretta. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, lovely, lovely. And puts dad on, but whatever. But I, I mean, I, I, you know, I watched the Depp film. I'm a total fan. I watched the Johnny Depp film, and I, you know, and I knew a little bit about his film history and credits, but. I remember that. I remember Buddy Hackett calling me when I was just done a week earlier watching Herbie the Love Bug. Buddy Hackett calls. <coughs> Never forget that voice. Hello, is John there? I mean, I'm getting like <laughs> people like that would call all the time. And, you know, it was exciting. It was different. And it was a kick. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, we had you. Know, it wasn't that way at all. It was just always like, Bob, Dad, you know? Because I think. What people, you know, my father did movies in the 40s and 50s when there was no residuals. So, you know, we had a comfortable, nice life, but he wasn't a multimillionaire. He didn't have the kind of, you know, chops and money that, you know, Fonda and Wayne got. So we didn't live on our own island in Newport Beach. So, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, people would come and call and, you know, and I was, uh, you know, I lived the, normal middle-class life you know just to, like i say the only difference is my friends families parents were plumbers and you know filmmakers too i mean i had to remember i grew up in burbank you know so but i had friends that worked in all different industries and just so happened that my dad just was the one pretending to be a cowboy or charlie's angels pretending to be kate jackson's father i remember i was really i love that i was a huge fair Fawcett fan growing up Mm -hmm. so anyway but yeah that's wonderful cool well stuff. our time's our time's coming to a close i just want to say from all of us monster kids thank you for sharing sharing your father with us for an hour and and i would love to have you back in the future to share some more stories and and we appreciate you and we really thank you for your time thanks michael i i appreciate it if you can't tell like listen thank you all for just letting me remember and 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 you know go on and just reminisce about my father but again the fact that i'd be doing this and and that you're interested and that other people are interested in my dad anytime they have anything specific they want to ask if i remember you know the more and more you and i talk we come up with more and more stories but like i say i thank you that it's like this is fun but my father would have what i said earlier had you come over, you would have sat in the house and he would have just became your friend. It's just the way he was. He, he, there was no delineation between, he just loved people. So. Awesome. I like people too. So. Well, we like you too. So thank you Thanks, so much. Man. Thanks, right. Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir.